Hi, this is Robert Rapier from R Squared, and this is R Squared Energy TV. In this week's episode, I've got a couple of questions that sort of highlight some of the trade-offs that we have to make uh, on our energy supplies. I often say there is no free lunch. Every energy source we have, there is some cost associated with it. And this week's questions are about palm oil and about fracking. And there are issues around that that, uh, you know, there's some environmental issues. There are issues associated with cheap energy, with uh, future energy supplies. And so let's get right into that. Um, what is your take on the EPA excluding palm oil renewable diesel from qualifying for the RFS2? Also, do you think palm oil can be produced sustainably? So, um, you know, the, the issue with palm oil is that a lot of the rainforests in Southeast Asia are being uh, cut down and encroached upon to plant palm oil plantations. And therefore, in the RFS2, the Renewable Fuel Standard, the EPA said palm oil does not qualify as renewable fuel. Um, I don't agree with that decision. And the reason is palm oil can be produced sustainably. Just because some people don't produce it sustainably, um, doesn't mean that I would completely throw it out. There are ways to certify and uh, the, the forestry, forestry provides a good example here. Um, in logging around the world there are logs that come from pristine rainforest and that are environmentally uh, you know very damaging but there are some certifying boards like the FSC certified forest says that you meet certain uh, sustainability requirements and if people sell FSC certified wood they can be uh, pretty assured that they are not getting wood that's you know sourced in an environmentally irresponsible way and so the same thing could be done for uh, palm oil. Palm oil provides an opportunity for many farmers uh, in poor countries to have a cash crop and and there are agricultural lands that exist today that could be used to grow palm oil so I think instead of just excluding it, I would have, uh, I would have changed the way that, uh, that we look at it and, and make sure that there are some safeguards in place. I mean, the alternative is, I visited Malaysia last year and I asked about this and they said, look, if the U.S. doesn't want to buy our palm oil, China will buy all that we can sell. We need to be more proactive there and not uh, defer to, and, and allow China to dictate what goes on there in uh, in the future of palm oil. You know, we need to encourage more sustainable practices and a, and a good market there. Um, ultimately, it may not matter. I mean, if China's willing to pay all, buy all their palm oil anyway, it may be very difficult and we may have to go about other means of uh, protecting the rainforest. But I don't think just completely excluding palm oil from qualifying is the way to go. Palm oil is potentially um, a, a very sustainable, competitive renewable fuel with, uh, with petroleum. So the next question about fracking. Um, can you do an episode on hydraulic fracking and your view on what role the United States natural gas will play in the energy future? Um, it's a, a pretty deep subject. It's hard to cover in just a couple of minutes, but uh, fracking has been around for uh, since, the, since 1949, it's when it was first used in the oil fields in Texas and Oklahoma. And what it involves is putting uh, high pressure liquid down into the, uh, down into the oil well and it fractures open the rock and allows easier flow of oil and gas into the well. Now in recent, recent years, fracking has been combined with horizontal drilling and that has opened up a lot of oil and gas that was previously uneconomical to produce. And so the fracking that's going on right now is a little bit different than the fracking that went on uh, in, the, in the 40s and 50s and, and historically you know, throughout the, the, the oil fields in Texas and Oklahoma. The, the combination is fracking with the horizontal drilling and there have been reports that, uh, in fact, one famous case, Cabot was uh, fined for contaminating some of the water supplies in the Marcellus Shale in uh, Pennsylvania. Now the reason that the water was contaminated was not actually the act of fracking and this is where fracking proponents will defend and say, you know, it can't possibly, uh, our fracking can't possibly contaminate the water supplies because we're fracking thousands of feet below the water table and if it was that easy to contaminate then oil and gas would have migrated into the, into the water table long ago. Uh, that's probably true, but it's also true that the, the, or, the bore is being drilled through the water table. And in Cabot's case, what happened was they didn't have the well properly sealed and allowed some of the fluids to leak out. 
Now, for a person whose water supply is contaminated, they don't really care whether it was the actual act of fracking or it was the moving around of the fracking chemicals in the water that got in their water supply. So as far as they're concerned, it's the, the, the fracking is the problem. Um, some people have their water supplies at risk and they aren't really getting any benefits. I mean, the, the, benef the, the risk is concentrated among a few people and the benefits are spread out over the country as uh, cheap natural gas supplies, which right now we've got a, a glut. I mean, natural gas supplies, uh, are, 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 the price right now has been driven down to like $2.50, which is uh, uh, low. I mean, it's a, I, I don't know when the last time it was that low. Now, this benefits consumers. Um, but again, it's, uh, it's a risk that's being taken by people that aren't necessarily seeing the sort of benefits that the people actually doing the fracking are doing. Um, so, can, and, and there are also people with agendas here on both sides. I mean, the, uh, of course, people expect the industry to have an agenda, but there are environmentalists here with agendas who are putting out research that is really not, uh, uh, it's not well substantiated. It's, uh, you know, they're making some assumptions that uh, are worst case scenarios and they're coming up with conclusions that really, um, you know, mainstream science is, uh, is rejects those conclusions or they're not telling the full story. And one example is uh, all these stories that have come out that said hydraulic fracking, uh, natural gas from fracking is worse than coal. There are a lot of things they didn't tell you there. Uh, they're assuming a very high leakage rate, higher than anybody thinks is reasonable. Um, they're assuming a very short global warming potential for natural gas, which again, most people don't think that's reasonable. Uh, but w one, of the, one of the major things is the reason that coal in the short term, swapping natural gas to coal, is deemed to be worse is because coal puts out particulate emissions in the atmosphere and they reflect some of the sunlight. So one of the issues is coal, by cleaning up the air, will allow more sunlight through and therefore in a very short term, natural gas would be worse than coal. But what they don't tell you is nothing would be worse than coal. I mean, it, just doing nothing, just shutting the coal plants down and replacing with nothing would also cause the models to say in the short term temperature is going to go up. So, you know, those are the kind of things that we have to watch, the, uh, the exaggerations, the, uh, you know, on both sides. You know, the oil companies, they, they have, you know, good funding and they've got good reason to uh, uh, pursue this, but most people don't realize some of these environmental groups are also very well funded and they get paid to, uh, you know, promote the opposite side. And, you know, what, uh, you know, I, I judge it by, are the, are, can, do the conclusions really stand on, on their own or, or is somebody really making a series of assumptions in their favor to come up with a specific conclusion? And um, I often look for peer-reviewed literature and I look for the responses to that literature. And, uh, you know, I, I think fracking, it's, it's obviously got a future. It's uh, grown immensely. It's tremendously increased the natural gas reserves in the U.S. But I also agree it has to be done responsibly. And, you know, we can't we can't contaminate water supplies, and, and if that's happening, and we can document that it's happening, then uh, it need, there needs to be a stronger regulatory environment. I don't think it's going to be shut down. Some states may shut it down, uh, but the revenues there are too great, and uh, um, the, the possibility that we can shift some of our oil dependency to domestic natural gas is, is very compelling. So uh, with that, that's a little bit longer than normal episode, but uh, I hope that, that filled in some of the gaps on, uh, you know, just some of the trade-offs that we make with our energy supplies. They're, they're there no matter what our energy supplies, we have to make difficult trade-offs. And, and sometimes uh, people don't like the trade-offs that they have to make for the benefit of everyone. And the fracking is a perfect example of people who live in the area, they don't like that being in their backyard, uh, impacting them for the benefit of, of large, you know, everybody in the country. So with that, uh, we'll see you next week. Thank you for tuning in.